coming. This, as you can see from my playbill, is a, a story about a play, but it's a, a play of all the world. Uh, all the world is a play for our characters. But first I have to begin with a little bit of hard historical evidence. Uh, a famous French revolutionary historian by the name of Georges Lefebvre said years ago that the preconditions for revolution consisted of an economic crisis, social and political oppression, and third, he said, an obstinate government. Those were the three conditions which he noted existed in, in America in the 1760s and 70s, and certainly in France in the late 1780s. I'm going to add what I call Brink's corollary to that, and that is, uh, in addition to these conditions, which are kind of clinical to a certain extent, I add the fact that people need vocabulary. They need to hear about these things in ways that they can understand them. And that's what puts people in the street. It put, it, it's the sort of thing that, they, that the crowd needs in order to understand the conditions which they sense and feel and react to, but oftentimes don't have the vocabulary to articulate. So today we're going to hear about some of those things. And so in particular, we're going to talk about a playwright by the name of Beaumarchais, who wrote two plays whose titles are probably familiar to you, probably because of subsequent uh, artists who contributed to those topics. Mozart wrote The Marriage of Figaro as an opera, and Rossini wrote The Barber of Seville as an opera. But in 1774 and 1784, Beaumarchais wrote The Barber of Seville and Figaro. So he is the author of the theater, the stage plays. And so I ask you, thanks to Catherine raising the screen, I ask you to imagine the stage as we go along and talk this afternoon. Uh, if you're like me, uh, probably in the summertime you'd rather be somewhere else than listening to a lecture. You'd probably be like, like to be reading a whodunit. That's what a lot of historians like to read, it seems to me, and quite a few of them write them. Uh, kind of a Jean Le Carré or a Robert Ludlum or an Ian Fleming uh, whodunit in the summertime. I'm dating myself again there. Uh, but I promise you that you can't talk today the, the factual historical cast uh, of this tale of clandestine meetings and disguises and false names and dummy companies and money laundering, all done on a world stage. Uh, there is a, the conventional story of how this happened, and you all know the story, and I'm not going to dwell on that part of it too much, but the conventional story is that the French alliance, which helped to supply and to add sailors and soldiers to our American forces in the American Revolution was thanks to Ben Franklin. Well, frankly, sorry, the bad pun. Franklin didn't do it. Uh, he helped to a certain extent. But before Franklin had even landed in France, one Silas Dean, who was later a disgraced member of the Continental Congress, worked out a scheme with an unlikely Frenchman today more, made more famous by the two plays that I just mentioned, of the five that he wrote, than for his amazing machinations to supply the American army. Silas Dean and Beaumarchais are the heroes of our story with one interesting addition, a cross-dressing spy. I uh, thought I would add that to our list of intriguing details about this story. So we've got double agents, we've got unstable pyro pyromaniacs in this story, we've got cross-dressers, as I mentioned, more details later, spies who write in invisible ink, uh, disguises, assassins, false identities. Uh, this is just an amazing tale. We have good dialogue for our play because of the 18th century habit of writing letters, lots and lots of letters. Everyone wrote letters. And they kept copies of the letters that they wrote. Some of you have been to Monticello. Nobody's been to Monticello. One man, couple. Well, there are two inventions that Dr. Thomas Jefferson has at Monticello, which I liked especially well. 
One was the dumb waiter that brought up a full bottle of wine when you sent down an empty bottle of wine. It's getting darker. <laughs> and the other one was his copying machine. You may have remembered that, where he invented a machine or a device where as he would write a letter, this device that would be hooked to his arm would make an automatic copy in the days before uh, Brother Dominic and the copying machine. It's actually darker now. <laughs> Well, we, this play may get over faster than I thought. Well, you have the playbill, and that'll help you to follow the cast of characters. I want to mention just one thing about the sources. Uh, I chose to read the most recent accounts of all of this because I thought you want to get what the latest information is. One of the things that happens is that uh, in about 2006, a man by the name of Joel Paul uh, was looking around for some letters of Silas Dean, or the papers of Silas Dean, and he was having a hard time finding them. And he, <laughs> he had taught law at the University of Connecticut, so he decided, and since Silas Dean was from Connecticut, he contacted the, the museum at, at Connecticut, or the Historical Society, and the fellow said, yes. He says, as a matter of fact, we just discovered these boxes and boxes of material of Silas Dean, given to us by his family. So here were boxes and boxes, according to Paul, who hadn't been, which hadn't been opened for generations, he said, and he began to plow through them. And six years later, he wrote the book that's on your bibliography. So there are some, it's recent stuff, that's what I'm saying. But I have to also say that this summer, I just got back from a, taking a group of students to Paris, and I rented an apartment when, when I hadn't seen the apartment before, when I arrived, I noticed it's in the Marais in the district of Paris that is in the 17th and 18th century was the sort of tawny aristocratic district with lots of fancy mansions. I said, this was an old mansion. It's been cut up into apartments. And I did a little research and it was the mansion of the Comte de Vergen. The Comte de Vergen is on your playbill. He's the French foreign minister. So as an additional source, every night, I waited for his ghost to come talk to me, to give me really the straight scoop on what was going on. Uh, he never came. I would have had a dilemma, I suppose, if he had, had come to talk to me. I don't know how I would have footnoted that uh, altogether. But um, in any case, I think we have otherwise some pretty good information for you. So let's start with our, our main character, our, our Beaumarchais himself. If you were looking at his business card, here's what you would see. Son, brother, husband, father, apprentice watchmaker, <clears throat> musician, inventor. He invented an escapement device for clocks. He was a, his father was a clockmaker and he was an apprentice to his father. He invented an escapement device which allowed watches and clocks to lie flat. Before that, they were kind of like eggs, they were round. But he invented this time regulation device which is still used in watches today. And he was a musician, quite a good harpist. And he invented a pedal system for the harp which is still in use today. So that, that's a pretty good accomplishment right there. He was an autodidact, he was a lyricist, he was a singer, an actor, a composer, a poet, a swordsman. He killed a man in a duel. A diplomat, an advisor to kings, an investor, almost like a wildcatter in our understanding of that sort of entrepreneurial spirit. He was an arms merchant. He was a, shopping, a shipping magnet. He was a spy. He was a libertine. He was a pamphleteer. He was an editor. He edited all of Voltaire's works, for instance. He was a publisher, an architect, a builder, a politician, a fugitive, a prisoner. He was a man of fashion, a courtier, a revolutionary, a philanthropist, an exile. And especially for the framework of what we're talking about this afternoon, he was a playwright. Those two plays, The Barber of Seville, in 1774, and 10 years later, Marriage of Figaro in 1784. He wrote a, a third 
play in that in Figaro trilogy called La Mer Coupon, but it failed, it, and that's why we don't even have an English title for it. Well, The Marriage of Figaro, some of you perhaps read it, attacks the very foundations of feudal despotism. The great French revolutionary George Danton said that Figaro killed the aristocracy. That's the vocabulary I'm talking about. That's that, that part of what I say is the Brink's corollary to Georges Lefebvre's three conditions. Napoleon called the marriage of Figaro the revolution in action. The people of France found through the words of Figaro and others in the play uh, words for their own cries for vengeance. And the one author who, who is from whom I, I got a good deal of information and whom I reached way back for, Elizabeth Kite, back in 1918. She said, through Beaumarchais, the third estate was at last finding a voice and rising to self-consciousness. So in addition to the Enlightenment writers, in addition to Montesquieu and to Rousseau and to Voltaire, uh, we have a playwright, someone who writes for the popular audience, who puts words into the mob's mouth, who makes them aware of and able to articulate uh, their anger. Figaro, one author has said, is to the French theater what Falstaff is to the British theater. That's pretty good. The play makes a decisive turning point in the visible decomposition of the old order and the constitution at first subterranean of the new order. Beaumarchais was Figaro and Figaro was Beaumarchais. Beaumarchais is writing his own sentiments. He comes from common stock. He comes from, he's the son of a watchmaker, and yet he rises to advise kings to be in the company of kings. And he said this, gold by God, it's the fuel of life. I shall stand by my ways, whiles, put vigilance to sleep, awaken love, seduce with songs, mislead, intrigue, and overcome the obstacles. He put those words in Figaro's mouth, but those are his words too, as you'll see shortly. Beaumarchais hated unearned privilege. He hated arbitrary authority. He hated what Voltaire called l'enfant, that is arbitrary power, power arrived at simply by birth, the vile thing. The play contains this iconic soliloquy by Figaro, this is some of the lines of the play. Because you are a great lord, Figaro rails at the Count Amadiva. You think you're a genius, nobility, wealth, rank, position. It all makes you so proud. And what did you do to earn so many rewards? You took the time to be born, nothing else. Apart from that, you're quite an ordinary man, while I, by God, lost in a fearless crowd, had to apply more knowledge and skills merely to survive, survive than it took to govern the entire Spanish Empire for the last 100 years. And you want to duel with me, he said. And that's that attitude that Figaro expresses to a nobleman. What about this Beaumarchais a little bit? I've read you his business card. He's been credited with being the agent of one revolution and the architect of another. And I will tell you right here today, and you probably are, some of you know this, but without Beaumarchais, I don't think we would have won the French Revolution. I think that he was single-handedly responsible for our victory, and I'll try to prove that. He was indeed a man who did not have a modest opinion of his own genius. He mastered calculation on a grand scale. He said, no enterprise was too vast for my comprehensive intellect. He was not very modest, as I said. He said in the letter to his father, the most comprehensive and lofty projects are no strangers to my mind. My mind conceives and comprehends with ease that which would immediately check ordinary indolent minds. I'm the busiest, cleverest fellow I know. I don't know what a father would think if a son wrote that to him, but it's a little haughty. Like many great men, he occasionally failed, maybe more than occasionally in his case. 
Elizabeth Kite back in 1918 said, no happiness had been denied, no human calamity was to escape him. He was imprisoned several times, once under the dreaded Lettre de Cachet, once in the Bastille, ironic that, he was imprisoned in the Bastille. Cut that away for a little later, I'll come back to it. He uh, was at one time one of the richest men in France and was more than once bankrupt, his credit ruined, his property seized, and his civil rights revoked. He had to escape France and he lived in exile in Hamburg in a beggarly garret to avoid an even worse fate during the French Revolution. He frequently turned to public opinion in his pamphlets and his plays to fend off personal and legal attacks, the forces of the censors and aristocratic authority. He depended on the public reading what he wrote, not only for the stage, but for the pamphleteers, to come to his defense. Beaumarchais won the hearts of all those, except those who, for personal reasons, were bent upon his ruin. Shakespeare's words from the title of my talk today uh, go on. So all the world's a stage, he says, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. Well, Beaumarchais certainly did play many parts, as is evidenced by this business card I've just described to you. But not merely, I would attest. As for the other actors on this world stage, whom you can see up here, there were some honest and forthright players, but all too many wily, unscrupulous, knavish men and women uh, in our play this afternoon. Obviously, I'm fascinated by Beaumarchais, his sense of bravura, his ardent opposition to unearned privilege. For him, America seemed the fulfillment of Figaro's individualism. So what a shock, what a blow later to be cheated by the system he believed represented his values of justice and fair play. What a betrayal, sadly. Another form of tyranny he opposed. But I get ahead of the plot a bit. Some facts to be reminded of before the curtain lifts. You always need to have a context that somebody needs to come out, especially in a Shakespeare play, and tell you the, the scene. So, things to remember, this 1756 to 63 war, we called it the French and Indian War, the Seven Years War, had ended with a humiliating defeat of France by Great Britain, and France lost all of her claims in North America, Canada, Louisiana. Held on to some islands in the Caribbean, luckily for them, the Sugar Islands actually meant a lot, meant a greater, greater amount of revenue from those Sugar Islands than they were getting from North America. The treaty ending that war in 1763 barred America from trading with anyone without going through English ports. Then it was a costly war for both France and Great Britain. And for Great Britain, the former policy of solitary neglect for those colonies over there, just sort of, they just sort of let them go, didn't really enforce a lot of things, um, came to a halt after this 1763 treaty as Great Britain determined that American colonies must contribute to the war debt. In fact, all these parliamentary acts, the Sugar Act of 64 and the Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts, uh, really weren't that onerous in terms of the amount of money they were gonna get, but the, was the fact that there was this void beforehand where they weren't being taxed, or at least the taxes weren't being enforced very much, and suddenly then a policy of imposing these taxes, which irked the colonists a great deal. So this led to more and more opposition and acts of rebellion by individual colonies, punctuated by the Lexington and Concord Battle of the 19th of April in 1775, and the victory of Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold at Fort Ticonderoga on May 10th in 1775. No shots fired at that battle. I don't know if you call it a battle that no shots were fired, but no shots were fired. And uh, Arnold and, and uh, well, Arnold in particular captured the guns of Ticonderoga, which were badly needed by the colonists and brought them down into New York. America soon found itself beyond rebellion and into revolution, for which we were definitely not prepared. 
We needed guns. We didn't have much artillery or many muskets, in fact. We didn't have much ammunition, gunpowder, all the accoutrements of war. Who to turn to to get that? Well, the old axiom, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, plays out here, the French. Despite the recent experience on the American frontier during the Seven Years' War, and so to our play come some of the players to begin to take their place on the stage. Some have some rather bit parts. There's a fellow by the name of Joseph Paré de Duvernay, who turns out to be important for Beaumarchais because he's one of the wealthiest men in France, and he backs Beaumarchais' financial adventures, and that propels Beaumarchais up in the social register, in the social, uh, and not only are his coffers filled from some of these financial adventures, but he gets more and more attention at Versailles. And then there's this small role played by Louis XV, who was king, you remember, from 1715 to 74, who was called by one historian a world solecism incarnate, which is not what you want on your tombstone and is supposed to have said, après moi le déluge, after me the, the flood. And he was certainly prophetic. And then Vergen, my, the guy that owned the building I lived in this summer, um, he's going to play a role here in our story. And Louis XV's grandson, Louis XVI, who came to the throne as a 20-year-old, married to a 16-year-old Austrian princess by the name of Marie Antoinette, Poor Louis, you know, I feel sorry for him. He was not really the man for the job. He's described by many as being rather slow-witted. His temperament was sluggish and he vacillates and would have been much happier playing with his locks. He liked to play fiddle with locks and so on. And yet he ultimately jumps the right way for American purposes and we'll kind of uncover that in a minute. He supports five years of war for America's war for independence. And then there's this most curious person, the Chevalier, which is a French word meaning the, the knight, of course. But you'll also see on your playbill that I describe her as the Chevalier. Now, the word doesn't actually exist because there's no, in, in feudal heraldry, there's no female knight other than in Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, so the Chevalier d'Eon is an interesting character. And she's sort of a Victor Victoria type character, if you remember that film that Julie Andrews starred in years ago. Uh, remarkably androgynous. Uh, a child prodigy, a decorated soldier, a, a sporter of the Order of Saint Louis, the highest military order France could give. She was a diplomat, he was a diplomat, and a spy. I'm going to get my pronouns mixed up here, as you'll see why in a minute. Louis XV had used him as a captain in the Dragoons, to dress as a woman and to spy on the Russians. He negotiated the treaty ending the Seven Years' War with some other people. And then Louis abandoned him and wouldn't pay him for his expenses. And it caused a lot of ill feelings, which resulted in a threat to blackmail Louis XVI against his grandfather's secret plans to renew a war with Britain. And that, that threat, unwittingly, becomes the catalyst that persuades Louis XVI to arm the Americans against the British. So isn't history strange? It's a, 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 almost a soap opera type event, which is going to lead to one of the greatest military alliances in history. Well, Beaumarchais is employed by Louis XVI and Vergen, the foreign minister, to go to London, where Dayon is sort of in exile, and to turn, get Dayon to turn over the incriminating documents that will embarrass the French, and to return to France as the woman she is accused of being. So there were lots of rumors flying that she was in fact a woman masquerading as a man. Beaumarchais woos her as a lover somewhat successfully, not in the physical sense, but somewhat successfully in the sense that she wants to do what he wants her to do. And she does return to France in late 1777 as somewhat of a 
a star, somewhat of a personality, a celebrity. Marie Antoinette sort of takes her under her wing and has her own dressmaker make clothes for her because she arrives in the dress of a captain of the dragoons, or he arrives in the dress. I'm sorry, back and forth, I can't keep it straight, but anyway, he arrives in the dress of a captain of the dragoons and Marie Antoinette sees to it that her dressmaker gives her a trousseau uh, fitting uh, a woman who's gonna be presented at court. And this is what gets Beaumarchais the credit and the credibility to push through his idea, his idea of arming the Americans to an at first reluctant version and finally to an indolent and reluctant Louis XVI. Now, Deon had claimed to be a man for 49 years. He was 49 when he came back to France in 1777. He lived for the next 33 years as a woman until 1810, and continued to fence, was considered a redoubtable swordsman, and as a woman fenced and gave fencing lessons until she was 70. In 1810 she died, and an autopsy was performed, and it was pronounced that she was a man. Now, you can make a, they have made a whole television series around this, you can imagine. Well, she's one of our characters, this cross-dresser. And then there's Arthur Lee. Arthur Lee from a prominent tobacco growing family of Virginia, trained as a physician in Edinburgh. Brothers and he eventually involved in colonial politics. Takes it upon himself to make contact with Beaumarchais early in this story, because he'd heard of Beaumarchais' idea, and proposed that the two work to supply America with the arms that America needed. He has an abiding disdain for people of the ilk of Benjamin Franklin, a mere printer, he called him, and Silas Dean, a mere shopkeeper. And he worked tirelessly, and if there's a villain in the piece, it's Arthur Lee. Arthur Lee worked tirelessly to ruin Dean and to ruin Beaumarchais, and you'll see how he does it. And now the grand entry, Beaumarchais, sent by the king, no less, to surely save the crown embarrassment, secretly, and he did it twice, by the way, he did it on another, another issue, and that was one of the reasons why Louis XVI was convinced he could do it again, but the other issue had to do with a, a sexual embarrassment for Louis XV. But this success will give him entree to propose his scheme of secretly aiding the Americans. He had some experience with gun running in his partnership with Paris, Paris Duvernier, the investor. With his enthusiastic embrace of the American cause, he proposed that France, through a loan to him, he would earn a 5% commission, would arm and supply the Americans. He rebuffed Lee, who had made that first overture, who caught wind, as I said, of Beaumarchais' idea, because Lee's bona fides seemed to be somewhat suspect. Lee didn't seem to have the credentials. But he quickly made contact as soon as Silas Dean landed, and the two worked together. Silas Dean, the son of a blacksmith, fortuitously educated at Yale, trained as a lawyer. He'd become a merchant, a wealthy, influential member of Continental Congress from Connecticut. He was sent to France officially as the secret emissary to work out a deal to supply an army of 25,000 on credit. That's a pretty tough job. We want you to go to France. By the way, he never spoke French, never learned to speak French. We want you to go to this country where you don't, can't speak the language and you can't understand the language. And we want you to get enough armed supplies for 25,000 men on credit. Luckily, he ran into Beaumarchais. So at this point, uh, 1776 now, America was kind of desperate for French recognition. Without it, they had recognition from no one. Without it, they were just rebels and traitors and pirates. With it, they were statesmen and diplomats and privateers. 
And other European powers would naturally follow, especially Spain, with a fellow Bourbon on the throne of Spain, and Carlos III. And also, Spain was a loser in the New World in that 1763 war. There were threats from Great Britain to Spanish possessions and antagonism by Spain against Portugal in South America. Portugal, Great Britain's only ally and not a very strong one. For Dean and others though, the Declaration of Independence, he saw it and it certainly was seemingly embraced this way, was written in large part to persuade Europeans, particularly the French, of the justice of the American cause something Beaumarchais was already acutely aware of. Americans in Beaumarchais's mind were godlike defenders of individual liberty, and he was ready to join with Dean to persuade first Vergen and then Louis XVI to support them. Note please that Vergen and Louis and later Charles III of Spain certainly never embraced the ideals of the American Revolution. It is a supreme irony, in the, as a matter of fact, that the most despotic monarchy in Europe, France, is going to support a rebellion against a kindred monarch, Great Britain, by commoners who opposed governing, who proposed governing their country by themselves. Beaumarchais knew that the aid had to be disguised, that we must send aid to the Americans, he wrote, in the most prudent way, to openly aid the subjects of the English crown in a rebellion was a violation of the Treaty of 1763 and a provocation for war. What Vergen and Louis had to avoid was a precipitous war with Great Britain. France couldn't afford it. But what they wanted, their motives, were in the future trading opportunities with North Americans, some assurance of protection for their sugar islands, and maybe even more so for Vergen especially, to humiliate the English. That was a big, he mentioned that a number of times in the letters. What worried the French all along was just partial success by the Americans, which could lead to some sort of settlement with Britain. There had been the Olive Branch petition back in July of 75, and that had worried them, even though George had refused it, didn't even pay any attention to it. And France hadn't given any aid at that time. But if France was to get into this, even clandestinely, it had to have some assurance that America would be successful. It was clear at the start to all that the colonies could not mount much of an offensive against the British. America had no means of producing big guns or even saltpeter for gunpowder in the volume that they needed. The earliest battles after Lexington and Concord were certainly no indicators that the ragtag army of General Washington could hold its own against the 30,000 British and Hessian forces. It's a credit to Beaumarchais' diplomatic skills that Louis agreed to the plan, finally, to place one million livres, about four million dollars, in today's money, in a dummy company, Rodrigue et Hortelet. That's, I'll anglicize that a good deal more later. Rodriguez and Hortelez, founded, ironically, on July 4th, 1776. They didn't know what was going on on July 4th, 1776. Beaumarchais leased a mansion in the Marais, that district in Paris I told you about, the Hotel des Ambassadeurs d'Hollande, at 47 Rue de Vieille du Temple. I went by it a couple weeks ago, looked at it, it's a beautiful old, mansion, 17th century mansion. It's been misused and neglected, but you can see the splendor that it once had. And he needed a splendiferous location for this dummy company. This company that was gonna buy gunpowder and arms and ship them supposedly to the Caribbean, supposedly to other places, but America was never mentioned. So here's a description, a concise description uh, of this money laundering ploy. This is kind of interesting. The firm would appear to be acting on its own without involving the French government so that the English could not hold France responsible. First, Beaumarchais would exchange half a million livres for Portuguese gold pieces. The gold would be sent to Congress in, the United, in America to finance the issuance of its own paper currency. 
The other half million livres would be used to purchase gunpowder secretly from the French armory at a discount. The Americans would cover the one million livres by sending tobacco, which Beaumarchais hoped to resell for three million livres. He would use the profit from tobacco sales to purchase more supplies for the Americans. By this geometric progression, Beaumarchais hoped to triple the amount of aid available to the Americans with each transaction. Beaumarchais suggested to Vergen that it would be a nice twist to pay for the initial one million livre by taxing British imports. Nifty. And that's the way the company was supposed to work. Beaumarchais went to work. He and Dean scoured the kingdom for supplies and ships. Beaumarchais would eventually have 40 ships under contract and armories and saltpeter dealers and a whole host of suppliers at his or Senor Rodrigue, since Beaumarchais often represented himself as Senor Rodrigue. There was an additional million livres from Spain quickly to follow, and plans were nearing completion for sending the ships abroad. With some delays, both Vergen and Louis vacillated when it came time to allow the ships to sail as the English spies were getting too close. They pulled back, didn't allow the ships to sail, embargoed the car cargoes and so on. But finally, three managed to get permission to sail, and they arrived, and this is important, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire on March 17, 1777. Three ships laden with military supplies. On board were artillery, cannons, mortars. I'm going to go through this whole list because it's kind of neat. Gun carriages, muskets, cannonballs, bombs, gunpowder, saltpeter, spades, matches, tents, blankets, uniforms, pants, shirts, caps, buttons, linens, hose, shoes, garters, buckles, and pocket handkerchiefs. Enough for 30,000 soldiers. And some of the 60 officers and engineers that Dean had illeg illegally commissioned. You know, one of the famous scenes from World War I is when the American college boys show up in France before the America got into the war and said, you know, Lafayette, we are here to return the favor. Lafayette had come over to America as a 19-year-old and had fought for American Revolution, and here these 19-year-olds were coming to France to help them out in the World War I. And they formed the Escadrille. Lafayette Espadrille, Lafayette Squadron. Well, half the cargo of this ship, these three ships that arrived in March, half of the cargo was sent overland through the rugged mountains and forests to Washington's bedraggled troops at Saratoga. There they faced General John Burgoyne, General Johnny. And with his infusion of arms and supplies, the American forces managed to Sterling victory at Bennington, Vermont, and later on, at, on October 17, 1777, at Saratoga. That was the turning point of the war. It was the turning point of the war because it was Washington's army, it was an American army that won a victory over a high profile English British general and his army, and parenthetically, they won it with French arms. The supplies represented over 5 million livres worth of goods. Nine-tenths of the Northern Army's supplies at the time came from France for that battle. Eighty percent of the Continental Army's supply of gunpowder came on those ships. I often tell my students that the French pulled the American chestnuts out of the fire. There's a good example. The turning point of the war. Saratoga convinced both Vergen and finally Louis, remember this had been done secretly, supposedly, that the Americans could, if properly supplied, win. And now, with this victory, and Burgoyne goes home in disgrace, with this victory, what the French didn't want is the Americans to treat with the British, to settle with them, before they had achieved absolute independence. And so, it was a timely moment for France, within a short time of hearing about the victory at Saratoga to come out of the closet, to come publicly and say that they had recognized the new United States of America and they had achieved two treaties, a treaty of trade and a treaty of military alliance. Two, and, and 
Today, our, our alliance with France is the oldest alliance that we have with any country in the world. It, we've never broken that alliance. So that treaty, those two treaties, were negotiated. Dean, Silas Dean, had a large part in that, but of course, Benjamin Franklin is the one who gets a lot of credit for the treaties, and maybe so. But this, I remind you now, France declaring war against Great Britain, this turns into a world war. Not only in North America, in Africa, in India, in the Caribbean, in the Mediterranean, the wars are raging. With this formal recognition by France came open commitment of troops and soldiers and sailors, some 10,000, some very able officers such as the Prussian Steuben, the young Marquis de Lafayette I mentioned, the Comte de Rochambeau, the Admiral de Glasse, de Grasse, and one interesting character, and I didn't know this until I did all this reading. Pierre Charles L'Enfant was among that group. He stayed after the war, and of course he helped design the city of Washington, D.C. Saratoga had effectively ended the war in the north. In the south, by October of 1781, a masked, a masked American and French sea and land force, 8,800 Americans and 7,800 French, soundly defeated Lord Cornwallis at Yorktown in Virginia, and the war in North America was over. Contrary to our agreement with France, America treated separately with Great Britain in November of 1782, leaving the French to work out a Treaty of Paris in January of 1783. Now, we know from the Greeks, back to our stage, that there are only two kinds of drama. Comedy ends well, and tragedy ends badly. The account that we just heard was a comedy. It ended well. The French aid to America, the victory of the American Revolution, good for America. Less well for Great Britain, but we're in America, so it's good for America. Obviously, uh, not too well for France, although the US and France can still boast of this alliance. But what we witness now is the rather seamy side of the treatment of our principal players, and we move from the comedy to the tragedy. I've told you about the Chevalier, Chevalier Deon. She's off the stage now. We won't worry about her. But neither Dean nor Beaumarchais, and they were the three people involved in the drama to begin with, because Beaumarchais went to save Louis' reputation from Deon, and then he met Dean. But Interestingly, neither Dean nor Beaumarchais were reimbursed for their expenses during their lifetime. Partly that was because of the attacks by Arthur Lee. Arthur Lee was still smarting from the fact that he'd been rebuffed by Beaumarchais, that he hadn't been the one involved in the deal, that he hadn't been the one to make the 5% commission. And no less furious with Beaumarchais, Lee determined to wreak vengeance on both by writing the Committee of Secret Correspondence, accusing Dean and Beaumarchais of deceiving both the French and American governments by charging Congress three million livres for what he said had been an outright gift of the French government. Monsieur de Vergen, said the minister, uh, the minister and his secretary, Lee wrote to the Secret Committee on Congress, have repeatedly assured us that no return is expected for the cargoes sent by Beaumarchais. This gentleman is not a merchant. He is known to be a political agent employed by the court of France. With two influential older brothers in Congress, the great orator Richard Henry Lee and the sedate but beloved Francis Lightfoot Lee, Arthur Lee's vicious accusations would haunt Dean and Beaumarchais for the rest of their lives. Dean was recalled by a letter of December 8, 1777, he left France on April 1st, 78, charged with financial improprieties because of Arthur Lee's calumny, outright lies. He was later, Dean was later forced into exile, ironically finally in Britain, where he died and was buried in an unmarked grave in Deal, England in 1789. He was financially ruined 
by the lies and the calumny of Arthur Lee, who was aided by his brothers and by John Adams and even Thomas Paine. Dean had neglected his business and his family for years and had used his own money and ruined his credit trying to get reimbursed by the American Congress for his expenses in France and for part of the capital for the supplies. He wanted, he thought he could prove he was justified in receiving $2.3 million. Beaumarchais said of him, he is one of the men who have contributed the most to the Alliance of France and the United States. Dean's earlier friendship with Benedict Arnold, not the best guy you want to be good friends with, evidently, uh, but both had been credited with the early victory at Ticonderoga, taking of those guns in May of 75, and Arnold had been the audacious victor at Saratoga. But that friendship was compromised, of course, when Arnold went over to the British and agreed to surrender West Point. As a result of Lee's political onslaught, Dean and Franklin stopped speaking, as did Dean and his own brother Simeon, his son Jesse, his stepson John Webb, and even John Jay. And although Tom Paine and Arthur Lee were eventually discredited, because they couldn't produce any evidence, and although the issue continued to come up several times over the next few years, and although notables such as John Jay, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, Alexander Hamilton pleaded with Congress to swear, swear accounts with Dean. Nothing substantive was ever done. From his exile in Ghent, Dean had written his one faithful brother Barnabas in 1781 over some compromising letters that had been intercepted and published. He wrote, it's high time the curtain should be drawn up and that the actors behind the scenes should be stripped of all disguise and false appearance, and the catastrophe of the piece should be placed in the full view of everyone. I have attempted to do this. I expect to be abused for it, and I'm sure I shall not be disappointed. Nor was he. The same goes for Beaumarchais. Although our indefatigable Frenchman continued from rags to riches and back again, Dean had earlier, in fact, congratulated him for having contributed more than any other person to the French government resolution to protect American liberties and independence. Beaumarchais claimed Congress owed him personally $14.4 million. Beaumarchais had, he said, had accounts uh, proving that he had shipped over $210 million in supplies. I'm putting them in 2014 dollars. The ships bringing supplies too often went back empty, however, when they were supposed to be loaded with prime tobacco. Beaumarchais sent an agent to America. There's a lot of crossing of the Atlantic at this time. You know, when we consider these were six-week crossings, and this, this shows you the seriousness of their purpose. Beaumarchais sends an agent to the United States to investigate what's going on, why can't they get any movement, and the agent writes him in 1778, early in this dispute, he says, in spite of the most formal agreements, these people find the means of obstructing all business and a pretext for breaking the most solemn promises. This business would be one of the greatest commercial operations ever engaged in if one could only rely on the good faith of these Republicans. But they have no principles, and I certainly believe that you should close all accounts with them. Despite this, Beaumarchais persisted in the venture, and remarkably, he never repudiated his faith in the ideals of the American Revolution. He claimed of all the roles he played on the stage and in the world, the role he played in Rodriguez and Portales was the honorable part which I had in the liberty of America and the greatest act of my life, the glory of my entire life. For him, the American Revolution symbolized the war that he had waged against the aristocracy his entire life. In his heart, Beaumarchais and Figaro were both Americans. Beaumarchais went on to have several other adventures. A supreme irony was a $6 million home, a mansion he built just ironically across the street from the Bastille. Location, location, location. He witnessed the mob attack on the fortress on July 14, 1789, but he wasn't singled out for the sort of abuse just then that the rich were to receive from the very heady days of the revolution, a kind of a testament to his popularity. In fact, he was charged with overseeing the dismantling of the Bastille. 
I don't know if you know this or not, but maybe some of you went to Mount Vernon as youngsters. And there in a glass case in the foyer of George Washington's home was a large key. And if you read the little tag, and I remember reading this as a youngster and I had no idea what I was reading. This was the key to the Bastille. The French sent it to George Washington in recognition of what the ideals of the American Revolution did to uh, inspire them. In 1989, George Bush sent the key back to France for their 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. Forced into three years of exile over another gun running misunderstanding, he returned in 1796, Beaumarchais did, death, financially strapped, and he died in 1799 with plans afoot to dig a canal through Panama. Guy never stopped. Now, it's interesting, there is no town in America named for Beaumarchais. No monument, no stone, no portrait in the National Portrait Gallery. There is a statue to him in his old neighborhood in the Marais, and he's buried in the famous Parisian cemetery of Père Lachaise, but his lavish home was torn down in the early 19th century to make way for a boulevard in his name that leads right into the Place de la Bastille. Finally, though, in 1835, the U.S. Congress closed the books on Beaumarchais' claim. They needed to make a claim of their own on the French, and so they thought it was probably a good idea to clean up any ones that they had against themselves. So uh, they, in, in kind of a Dickensian finish to this story, uh, gave some, offered some $3 million, a mere 35% of what Beaumarchais and many others had proved was owed him, and that sum was accepted as a settlement by the family. Joe Paul sums up our theme quite well. Beaumarchais lived much of his life, he says, on stage, and it was not merely his theatrical productions that were mounted as public spectacles. His inventions, music, writing, romances, legal problems, and political battles were public performances, part comedy, part drama. But the most fascinating plot Beaumarchais ever imagined was the one he enacted behind the scenes, the one he never had the chance to write. Well, that's the end of our play. The curtain comes down. But th the fact is, and you know this, that the French reaction and the, the, the outcome of the French aid to America directly brought on the French Revolution. The amount of money that the French spent, not only in delivering the aid to the Americans, and the amount of money they spent in the war, once they declared war against Great Britain, bankrupted the monarchy. And that drove the monarchy to seek a resolution by bringing the Assembly of Notables in 1787. And the notables threw up their hands and said, we can't do anything. You have to bring in the Estates General, which hadn't met since 1614. <laughs> they were brought in in 1788. And of course, you know, in, on July 14, 1789, the revolution began. But I can't dismiss the role also of the 10,000 soldiers and sailors. Those French soldiers and sailors who came to our shores and fought in our battles, and I'm sure they said, "What? Well, where are we? You know, soldiers and sailors, where are we? Well, you're in North America. What are we doing? Well, we're fighting for these Americans. Well, what do they want? Liberty. They want to govern themselves. Huh. We don't do much of that where we live. And I, I just have a sneaking suspicion that if we could interview those inarticulate players in history, we'd find an awful lot of them uh, very interested in what was going on in the latter part of the 1780s. And here's what Edmund Burke said, the great conservative English statesman. French officers were witnessing and experiencing individual liberty and its benefits for the first time. They imbibed a love of freedom nearly incompatible with royalty. Thank you very much.